I'd like to talk to you about your environment. And I don't mean the environment. I mean your environment. That's the place where you live. But it's also the community that you live in and the people that you live with. How do you engage with them? How do you move through your world? Because for most of us, we traverse our world through a set of prescribed paths, most of which are just a series of right angle turns going from one place we already know to another place we also already know. While all the space in between them is a blank. How can you know a thing when 99% of it is ignored? So I think there's great value in exploring those spaces in between, the little things that you may know exist, but that you rarely explore. Things like walls. And you may not know this, but some people don't like it when you climb on their walls, which is fine. That's their prerogative. You just have to be creative and deal with things like signs. <laughs> or bridges are surprisingly fun, actually. There's nothing inherently different about any of these objects when I interact with them versus anybody else. But I am willing to bet that I perceive them a little bit differently. My name's Mark, and I've been training parkour for over a decade. And if you're wondering what parkour is, it looks like that. And of course, I could give you some sort of token definition that we like to throw around, something like parkour is going from point A to point B in the most efficient manner possible using only your body. But I could just as accurately describe dance as to move one's body rhythmically with music. It's like, yeah, but there's more to it than that. And for me, just being completely immersed in my environment and training my body, my mind, and my perception to interact with it in an increasingly skilled manner so that I can both contribute to and move through my world better. That's the essence of parkour. To me, hard emphasis on the words to me here. It's a very personal discipline, and it's not like I'm some sort of parkour herald here. I don't even have a man bun or <laughs> sloppy sweatpants. But I will say this, training parkour produces unique perspectives, which are themselves the result of a deeply inquisitive and playful approach to the world around us. And taking that approach and applying it to the rest of my life helped to spark this personal renaissance in my life. And the more time I spend here at Neomed learning how to be a doctor, the more that I think that this is important for healing. And not just for individuals, for providers, communities, and systems. So I'm going to try to illustrate this perspective by taking a series of traditional views, which I think are essentially valid and widely held perspectives, and just talk about how for each one, parkour has shifted my perception of that topic ever so slightly and why I think that shift is important. And while the topics themselves don't really matter, it's more about the approach and how it affects perception and everything downstream of that, I am gonna stick with themes that make sense within the context of parkour. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about motivation for physical activity, fear, overcoming obstacles, and creating genuine connection for healthy communities. And all I'm hoping to do here is just convince some of you to dip a toe out into that space in between and maybe just play around a little bit. Because if you're willing to do that, you have the potential to create a diverse and healing microculture in your community. So let's dive in. I would like to talk about physical activity first, or at least the motivation for physical activity. And I think we generally think about it something like this. You need to be active to be healthy, so find motivation to exercise. And I doubt anybody in this room would disagree with the idea that physical activity can have a positive impact on health or that you need to be motivated to see the benefits of that. And in fact, when we prescribe physical activity for patients dealing with you know, diabetes, depression, hypertension, we're actually taught to engage in something called motivational interviewing, where you try to figure out, is this patient willing to do this thing? And if they're not, what are they motivated by? And is there any way we can help them bring those things together? so that they can be more successful. And this is great, this is a wonderful tool. But even with that, how many people actually engage in the prescribed amount of physical activity? The reality is in our modern world, we've removed ourselves from the necessity of just using our bodies as a means of surviving our environment. And oddly enough, 
it might just be killing us. I know I felt like I was dying. After I started training parkour, I gained 50 pounds within a year. And that's right. I said 50, five, zero pounds gained. And if you had seen 125 pound mark, you would understand why I needed all of those. It felt amazing. It was like hitting puberty again, but without the uh, awkward bits. So why did that work so well for me that time versus every other time I had tried? And for so long, I can tell you for a fact, it was not fear of my increased risk of mortality. I thought parkour was cool, so I wanted to do it all the time. So let me take my shift here, my little parkour shift. After training for 11, 12 years, I have engaged in a lot of physical activity with a lot of different people and seen the results long-term. And at this point, I truly believe that people will consistently engage in the activities that they enjoy for their own sake and in almost nothing else. Essentially, it has to be cool or they're probably not going to do it. And I don't think it's too much of a leap to take traditional motivational interviewing questions, which appropriately focus on long-term goals. Questions like, well, why would you want to be active so that you can be more mobile and play with your grandchildren or live longer and see them graduate college and just add something that focuses on the action as well. A question like, what was the last thing that you saw that made you stop and think, wow, I wish I could do that. That's so cool. I have asked this question a lot, and the answers that people will give are astonishing. And who will answer what? And how many people actually achieve those goals if you just ask the question and give them permission to be excited about it? Grandpa wants to hula two hoops at once? All right. Middle-aged woman who's never done sports a day in her life wants to learn how to roller skate and join the roller derby? That's cool. Although a surprising percentage of the population just really wants to be able to do a backflip, it turns out. So obviously you need to have long-term goals to be successful long-term. But for every long-term objective, there's thousands of moments of hard work. So why not try to motivate the moment as well? Okay, let's talk about fear now. And generally when we discuss fear, we talk about how are we going to defeat our fears so that they don't hold us back. And this seems like a perfect parkour ideal, right? Perhaps not in the way that you think. I have a situation that comes up fairly often where I'll have an athlete who says something like, ah, coach, I know I can do it. I'm just afraid that I might slip, trip, fall, and break my foot or face, whatever. Now, I wouldn't have them attempting the skill if they weren't capable and ready to do so. So it seems like an appropriate response. You can do it. Just go for it. Don't worry about it. My response? That's a realistic concern. That, uh, that absolutely could happen to you. And th I mean, that, I think most adults can take this on board fairly easily, but if you can imagine what a seven-year-old's face looks like when their coach just told them that they might break their face, which that's not the end of the conversation, um, by the way. Generally, I'll say something like, okay, how likely is that to happen? What are you going to do to reduce that risk? How bad do you want it? And considering all of those factors together, is it worth it to try it now? Or do we need to make some adjustments before moving forward? Fear is not the enemy. It's a tool. But we do have to learn how to use it. And when you aren't interacting with your environment, and dare I say, in situations where fear is the most appropriate response, well, you can lose that ability to control and evaluate fear in other circumstances. This can show up anywhere. Medical school has lots of exams. Big scary exams. And I know how crippling test anxiety can be. That's excessive fear and it needs to be managed. But I also think it's valuable to be afraid before the exam. Fear, I mean, failure is a big deal in this circumstance and it has real consequences. And the motivation that fear can provide, that forced moment of self-reflection and evaluation before taking that next action, that's important. So yes, fear can be overblown and a hindrance. But risk is real. So we need ways to approach it. How about this one? Overcoming obstacles. This is uh, the subject matter, I think, probably about 50% of all the motivational speeches you've ever heard in your life. And in parkour, this is what we do. This is our thing. 
Although sometimes it feels like we spend more time finding the obstacles than we actually do overcoming them. I mean, the obstacles, the whole point, that's the fun thing. And of course, once we do find it, we try it over and over and over again, and eventually we get it. And that feels great, but it's immediately followed by the next challenge. So we spend most of our time failing, not on the big stuff. Obviously there's a way to approach that specifically, but it's part of the process. So I don't think there's anything really ground shaking about the implied advice here. You know, it's about the journey, not the destination, or probably much more accurately, it's just you need to have a growth mindset. However, there is a difference between knowing and understanding a concept versus living it every day in a culture that supports and demonstrates it. Because when you think about it, the culture of the community that you live in is one of the largest determining factors in the success and the happiness of the people in that community. Which brings me to my last one. We need to build a good culture. And we talk about building a culture of success or building a, a culture of excellence, but they're not just single traits. There's many traits. And of course, the culture we want to build is good. But what does that even mean? Again, I feel like we've blinded ourselves as a society because we've removed ourselves from the necessity of interacting with our neighbors, our enemies, or literally anybody who doesn't vibe with our social media feed. And I'm not saying it's malicious, it's automated. But I do feel that we need ways to push back against this if we're going to have healthy communities. We need reasons to interact with what is one of the most variable parts of our environment, the people. And the people who will show up to an open invite free parkour event are pretty interesting. Uh, even with my small community group, Denver Parkour and Free Running, I had over 200 events where I either helped to um, train new people on how to do parkour or where I jammed out with some more experienced uh, practitioners. And if you're wondering what a parkour jam is all about, just imagine like a music jam, but with parkour and you'll, you'll get the idea. So I've met and trained with hundreds of people. And it's kind of crazy what you can pick up from the people that you creatively interact with. There was a period of time where I was swearing in Russian every time I hit my shins. And of course, I've met lots of 20-year-old flip fanatics. There are plenty of them, but also 60-year-old war vets, Native American artists, heavy metal vegans, face-tatted skaters, tea shop entrepreneurs, executives, hug-crazed personal trainers. I taught parkour for a living. That was my job. But for nine years, anybody who showed up to a Denver parkour and free running event could receive the best level of instruction that I could provide for free. There was no barrier. And I've learned more about the people in my community in that time than I really have any way to express to you. And at a time when our society really seems to be struggling with these ideas of inclusivity, the value of diversity, and some of the barriers that exist to appropriately distributing resources so that we can benefit from that diverse thinking, we're talking about it and arguing about it, writing about it and debating it. But when was the last time that you just creatively interacted with somebody who isn't like you? Maybe we don't just need more education and initiatives, but more spaces where that sort of engagement can occur. Spaces available to everyone, of interest to anyone, and without obligation or expectation. Because if there's one thing I've learned in my time in the parkour community, it's this. Anybody can create that kind of space. Anyone. If you're willing to play in those spaces in between, find your cool thing, immerse yourself in it, and then most importantly, share it without reservation. So I'm not here to tell you that you need to do parkour to improve your life. Although I definitely think that you should. <laughs> and I, I bet that it would. I'm just here to remind you that you have an environment and that it's full of objects, people, opportunities. Go explore them because you're going to learn a lot more about movement from climbing a tree or wall or bridge than you will from going to the gym. You're going to learn a lot more about the people in your community by creatively engaging with them than you will from any sort of diversity training. And you're more likely to have the culture you want if you're willing to build it. So go play.